It's time for the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Where's the slice? And Rish Outfield. Ah, ¿dónde está la carne? Plague bird singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly. All your life. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Yes. Thanks for coming, folks. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rish Outfield. And what episode would this be, sir? Episode 125. Now, if this were a comic book, we could have a special 125th anniversary issue and charge more for it. Do you think that would be okay if we did that on this episode? Sure, but... It's a special double... Su- does it count as 125th anniversary? That's Doesn't that mean the do. show has been going for 125 years? Now, that's, a, that's a very good point. But any excuse to have a double-sized issue, I think any multiple of 25, I yeah. would think that that... Okay, yay. Cool. And so nowadays, this... comic books don't make it very far, so just 25 is an anniversary <laughs> issue. Yeah. So this could be giant size, Dune Steef, then. Yes, I, I, I like that. Okay, pick a story, something special that we can do for our pseudo-anniversary. Okay. Hmm, how about a Jason Sanford story? No, something else. How about a g- giant-sized Jason Sanford story? Okay, but you've twisted my arm. Okay, hey, here, here. <laughs> I will see your Jason Sanford story and raise you a sequel to a Jason Sanford story. Ooh, how about a sequel to a very popular Jason Sanford story called Plague Birds? Okay, I think that's fine. All right, then. That's what we'll do. All right. Good night, folks. (laughs) Okay, so what is that? What is the story called? The story is called The Ever-Dreaming Verdict of Plagues. Sequel to... Plague Birds, which ran about this time last year, if I recall correctly. And I, Do you I think, want to tell them what episode number, just for the heck of it? Because oh, sure. I think it, it would behoove them to have heard Plague Birds before listening to sequel to Plague Birds. It's not like a Catastrophe Baker story where there's no... I almost said there's no benefit to listening to the other ones. Basically, the stage has been set by the first Plague Birds story. And you are much more prepared. Peacemaker, peacemaker, little bo peep. By listening to this. The episode from the last story was episode 92. And you can check that one out in our archives. And yes, do that now if you haven't listened to Plague Birds. We will wait. That's right. Just put it on pause. And as long as you've got a nice player, it will remember your spot that you were at. Mine, I don't think, does that anymore. So i got to scroll through. That sucks. Anyways, so yes, Plague Birds Part 2, The New Batch. Ooh, I like that title. The Squeakle. <laughs> <laughs> Who produced this episode? This episode was produced by the same guy that produced it last time. Really? As soon as he heard there was a sequel to Plague Birds, he's like, let me do one story first and then I'll do that one. It was like uh, Christopher Nolan. Where he's like, yeah, I know, the last one kicked ass. I know you love me. I want to do this other thing, and then I'll do that thing that you're begging me to do. So, uh, yeah, Brian Lincoln is back again, producing uh, Plague Birds Part 2, Chipwrecked. <laughs> <laughs> yes, today's story is The Ever-Dreaming Verdict of Plagues by Jason Sanford. And it's not often that this kind of thing happens. But I think this story is perhaps twice as good as the last one. And the last one was good. So that'll tell you. So a Dark Knight versus a Batman. Right. Or are you one of those people that likes Begins better? No, no. I think Dark Knight was uh, definitely a more superior film. And uh, that's basically what you got here. You don't get that very often. Very seldom do you get a sequel that is even worth anything, much less better than the original. But I think this one's even twice as good. Okay, well, then would you say that this is a Wrath of Khan versus a, a motion picture? Yeah, you could say that. No, no, I don't think so. Because okay, I didn't appreciate the motion picture much. much better than motion picture is Wrath of Khan, as, as percentage-wise? You could say probably 50% or more. Okay, you need to see Wrath of Khan again, sir. Because, I mean, we're in the... Th- quadruple digits oh, i watched them both a long time ago when i was still a teenager because dark knight is a superior sequel to a really good movie right and wrath of khan is a fantastic sequel to a 
pretty bad movie. Yeah, I was not a fan of the first Star Trek film, so it's hard for me to say. I, I remember kind of sleeping through it. So, anyways, we'll talk more about sequels after no. the story has run because now I, now I want to talk about Star Trek. <laughs> Forget Jason Sanford; he'll forgive us, right? Because <laughs> all the people that have come to hear this story have now tuned out. They're already pushing fast forward, so all right, we no. might as well let them go. No further words from me. Very well. On to the story, everyone. R O eight O T O eight. About the author. Oh, thanks, announcer man. We almost forgot to do that. Uh, Jason Sanford is a speculative fiction writer from Alabama. He recently published a short story collection called Never Never Stories. It includes such Sanford greats as the ships like clouds risen by their rain, when thorns are the tips of trees. Here we are falling through shadows, a 21st century fairy love story, and the Never Never Wizard of Apalachicola. You can get the ebook or print edition by following the links in the show notes. And one other person that we wanted to thank, but we always forget to mention, is Melissa Hills, who did the episode art for today's show. She also did the episode art for Save the Date as well as taking up the mantle back when we first asked why not and doing art for our first 13 episodes, which had been without art up to that point. And her art is always really awesome, and we wanted to thank her for her hard work. Uh, She busted this week's art out for us last minute without any complaints or whines that you would have heard if we'd asked ourselves to do something like that in such a small amount of time. So thanks so much, Melissa. Uh, And now, finally, on to the story. The Ever-Dreaming Verdict of Plagues by Jason Sanford Murder it is. Christina Dane thought as she gripped the condemned woman's face. The woman, Jennery Flats, stood five hands higher than Krista, an impossibly tall human whose every movement flowed to grace like doves climbing the highest reaches of sky. Not that Krista could mistake Jenry for a dove. Yes, her face was covered in downy gray-brown feathers, but her gaze burned to the brightness of eagles, orange eyes which glared at Krista with both defiance and sadness. As Krista pulled back from Jennery's memories, she released her grip so the woman collapsed across the village's dirt stage. Jennery shivered as her friends and neighbors howled for her death. (laughs) The blood AI inside Krista smoked and giggled. It healed the cut on Krista's hand, through which the artificial intelligence had caressed Jennery's mind, and whispered of the violence to come. Iron bile flooded Krista's mouth as memories of the many deaths the AI had gifted across the centuries flickered through her. (laughs) An unending shriek of joy at the guilty being gutted and split and ripped and torn and eaten and dismembered. Krista rubbed the red line burning from the corner of her right eye to her lips and again wished she could rip out the AI inside her. In the six months since this creature had entered her body, she'd been responsible for a handful of those violent memories. Now she had to kill this bird woman lying in the dust before her. Jennery's eagle eyes again locked onto Krista's, and, while remaining defiant, begged for... what? Krista couldn't say. All Krista could give were the rules, and punishment, and nothing more. Well, plague bird, the village alderman growled. Krista turned on him, angry at the insolence in his voice, her eyes screaming red fire until the alderman wilted before her, bowing his tiger-jeaned body as he apologized. The assembled villagers shifted nervously in the dark, amused at their overbearing leader being taken down a notch, but also afraid of him and Krista. She's guilty, Krista announced. I've seen the murder. She threw the child off the dam. The villagers hissed and growled while the alderman moaned a deep, primal cry. The dead child had been his son. 
Krista looked around her. The villagers twitched and shook to the genetic pox as glowing cat eyes mixed alongside ordinary human eyes, and angry whispers rasped from muzzles and snouts and lips. And teeth. Not a single human tooth shone before Krista. Instead, fang and drill and flashes of what looked like razors glinted in the villagers' mouths. Krista had never seen a village with such extreme genetic variation. If Krista hadn't been a plague bird, these villagers would have killed her for daring to enter their sanctuary. They still ran wild, teeming with the gened instincts and fury which flowed across humanity these days. They're a new village. Her blood AI, which called itself Red Day, whispered in her mind. Not one generation from the hunt. But that doesn't change your duty. Krista nodded. If she hadn't been here, the villagers would have already ripped Jennery Flats to meat. While their justice would have been bloody, it would have also been far more merciful than what Krista was about to do. Still, Krista had her duty. She pulled one of the twin red knives, sheathed to her red trousered thighs, and shook her scary stalk of red burned hair. You know the rules, she yelled, pointing the knife at the villagers. Go against them and you die, painfully. Since this woman broke the most important rule, she's mine. Krista hated how silly her overdramatic performance sounded, but Red Day always encouraged her to act the part. As the AI often told Krista, punishment wasn't the biggest deterrence for people. It was fear. And what did people fear more than a plague bird? Mm. Krista sliced her own wrist with the knife, sending a crimson arch through the air as Red Day rushed free. The blood AI circled and shrieked and fell towards Jennery, licking into everyone's mind so they could see exactly what it planned to do. Krista saw an imagined flash of the bird woman being split up the middle, of the AI ripping her womb out and revealing the child inside, of Red Day throwing the still-forming child before Jennery's eyes as she screamed for mercy. In that instant, Krista stared fully at Jennery Flats. Even though her weather-worn smock hid the fact, Krista knew she was pregnant. Return! Krista yelled at Red Day. Her blood hovered in the air as the AI churned and screamed, unwilling to obey so close to feasting on another. The red line on Krista's face burned fire as she again ordered her AI to return to her body. Return! Red Day grudgingly obeyed, and the mist of blood flowed back into her wrist and healed her skin. Jennery Flats gasped and collapsed face down in the dust, overwhelmed by the unexpected reprieve. Krista grabbed the alderman and threw him into the crowd of villagers, who screamed and fled before her. She's pregnant! Krista screamed. Why didn't you tell me? The alderman stared at her from the dew-wet grass, the striped fur on his face rippling nervously. You are the plague bird, he whispered rubbing a patch of bare skin on his cheek. Shouldn't you know such things? <laughs> From inside Krista, Red Day chuckled its agreement. The alderman was right. She should have known. As the sun rose, Christina sat on the packed dirt porch of the alderman's house and watched the villagers go about their morning chores. A handful of people hoed the fields as others milked cows and slopped hogs. Compared to Krista's home village, which had existed for centuries and was so orderly its fields resembled a checkered quilt, this place was a disaster. The crops looked as if seeds had been thrown randomly on the ground, while the hog pens were little more than cut trees stacked in a square. Again, they are a new village, Red Day whispered. There's no record of another plague bird ever visiting here. You judge too harshly. Krista laughed at Red Day, <laughs> thinking her harsh. 
causing a passing villager to glance at her as if she was crazy. She considered ordering the AI to remove her presence from everyone's senses. Edit the stimuli the villagers' minds received so she was, for all purposes, invisible, but decided against it. Better they be reminded she was here. Too harsh, eh? She muttered to herself. <laughs> you wanted to kill a pregnant woman. Rules are rules. Her condition doesn't change the sentence. Still, strange you didn't know she was pregnant until I released you. I mean... You linked with her body and mind. Red Day's silence told Krista the AI was also irritated, missing such an obvious fact until the last moment. Krista stood up to check on Jennery Flats. The alderman had gifted Krista his crudely built log house for the duration of her stay. He'd also offered to lock Jennery up in the village barn. But Krista had refused. With everyone's blood up at the murder, she didn't need someone turning vigilante. So she'd placed the woman in the alderman's cellar and stood guard herself. Unfortunately, this meant she was forced to spend more time than she liked around Jennery. It was hard enough to kill a stranger, but to kill someone you were beginning to know on a personal level? You've kissed her memories, Red Day said snidely. There's nothing more personal. Or perhaps I should say more intimate than that. Krista ignored the AI. She unbolted the rough-hewn cellar door and walked into the darkness beneath the house. Jennery crouched in the dirt corner, wedged between two of the foundation's stacked mica stone columns. The tall, thin woman growled softly, a wolf-gened urge which brought a smile to Krista's face. The woman was of part lupine heritage, the same as Krista. But her eyes and down feathers were obviously gened from eagles, an amazing mix of animal and human. Even more amazing was that compared to her fellow villagers, Jennery was one of the most human here. Krista sat on the bottom stair. Are you hungry? Thirsty? What does it matter? Just kill me. I'm no good at waiting. Red Day again whispered its offer to kill the woman. I'll do it with mercy, with no pain to the woman or her unborn child. Krista shuddered, not trusting any promise the AI could make. You should still eat and drink, Krista said. And I haven't decided what to do with you. Jennery laughed. <laughs> You've seen my memories. I killed the child. Every moment you wait only makes the others fear plague birds a little less. Krista nodded calmly, but Red Day shrieked inside her, <laughs> eager to enact its justice on this self-admitted killer. As Red Day's anger exploded, the AI seized control of Krista's right hand and grabbed one of her knives. With a shout of no, no! Krista ran up the stairs. After bolting the cellar door shut, she stumbled to the porch and threw up. When she looked up, she saw the alderman watching her from beneath a nearby oak tree. A single bare spot of skin on his striped fur face gleamed in the sunlight, exposing the green tattoo of a star. The alderman grinned happily and crunched large acorns between his powerful tiger jaws almost as if enjoying an amusing comedy at some harvest festival. Shit! Krista cursed. Even Red Day burned with irritation at being caught in a vulnerable moment. Krista stormed into the log house and slammed the door shut. She knew Jennery Flats had to be killed. It didn't matter if she was pregnant. There were limits to how long she could keep the blood AI from its program duty. If she refused to release it, Red Day might free itself and seek a partner less willing to control it. Maybe even that alderman, who would no doubt thrill at using the AI's power. Easier to say than do, the AI whispered. And you forget that we're a good match. There are also things here I don't understand, which, as you know, shouldn't be possible. Krista grinned at Red Day's admission. 
which was as close as it had ever come to admitting a mistake. Not a mistake. It muttered. A curiosity. Why don't we talk to someone about that curiosity? While Krista could sense that the village's own artificial intelligence was nearby, for some reason Red Day couldn't pinpoint it. After they walked in circles for a half hour, Red Day finally admitted it couldn't direct Krista to its fellow AI. Krista smirked and asked a villager for directions. Instead of answering, the man, a cross between human and bear, glared hungrily at her for a moment before rubbing his right cheek. Under his thin black fur, Krista saw the faint outline of another green tattoo in the same star design the alderman wore. The bear man snorted and pointed to the forest east of the village. Hmm. Cross the dam. The AI's in the church on the other side. Krista thanked the man and walked away, ignoring the threatening way he watched her until she disappeared into the trees. Red Day grumbled about the need to teach this village respect. But Krista said no. That wasn't their duty. Strange how you remind me of duty. You're the one who stopped us from our one true duty. Krista pushed Red Day to the back of her mind and, instead of worrying about the blood AI, tried to enjoy her walk. The trees soon rose tall around Krista, shading the sunlight into green speckled motes and swirls which played across the damp undergrowth. Krista loved forests. Never mind that she'd grown up in a village of neat houses and fields and people who daily restrained their animal instincts. No, while that far distant village may have been home, the wolf in her loved forests the most. There was nothing better than the cool, close-in scents of water and drip, decay and death, bud and leaf, oak and pine. Forests comforted her. Forests wrapped her body in love and reminded her that all had once been well in her world. As a child, she'd often sneaked out of her house after sunset and run through the forest until tired. She'd then find a small clearing and lay down, listening to the night sounds of insects and owls and wolves while watching the stars spin away the hours. As she drifted in and out of sleep, it often felt like the stars themselves gifted her with dreams of being a wolf forever. Life would have been so simple as a wolf, she thought. Uncomplicated. Far better than being cursed into a plague bird's life. Thank the stars such silly dreams eventually end. Red Day said, snapping Krista out of her memories. The blood A.I. snickered as Krista cursed him under her breath. Krista walked until the forest suddenly ended, the oaks and pines stopping as the ground turned to rock and crack ancient cement. Before Krista lay the largest lake she'd ever seen, its placid waters running for miles into the distance. Her heart seized at the sight and she fought the wolf inside her, which whined to return to the forest behind them. However, it wasn't the water which made Krista want to bolt in terror. It was the massive, translucent dam holding back the lake. Steady, Red Day crooned, acting as if Krista was a nervous pack animal. The dam won't bite you. Obviously built before the collapse of human civilization, the dam was thin, like a giant sheet of paper, yet ran a half mile across this rocky valley and Krista could see through the dam, as if through clear ice. The deep blue swirls of a massive wall of water rippled before her, held back by something so inconsequential, it looked as if a giant wave was about to crash down. The dam scared Krista more than any other remnant of the old world she'd yet encountered. Krista climbed up to the dam carefully, like a wolf sniffing for traps. She stepped gingerly onto the tiny walkway across the top and immediately jumped back, startled. While the dam looked slick as ice, it felt as solid as stone. Red Day chuckled. <laughs> Don't worry, it will hold you. 
Why can't I see through it? Red Day reached out and caressed the dam. Nanofilaments, it said, gently strumming molecular bonds too small for Krista to see. Fullerene buckyball chains, incredibly strong. While they aren't always created so light passes through, the designers obviously wanted a vertigo-inducing effect. Krista walked quickly across the dam, trying not to look at the reflections of waves and fish below her feet. The front of the dam dropped down for several hundred yards into a straight-edged spillway which surged with water. The power wasted except for a small village gristmill. This is where Jenry killed the Alderman's son, Red Day said, its thoughts low to the anger of justice denied. Krista glanced at the white foam waters below the dam as the memory of the child's murder ran through her mind. There's plenty of time to handle Jenry, she said. Red Day grumbled and retreated deep in her mind, sulking. Krista found the village's A.I. in an ancient stone church on the far lake shore, where the A.I. from Krista's home had been very much a mother hen, clucking over every person in its care as it worked to return them to their long-lost humanity. This A.I. was aloof, appearing to spend its days in isolated meditation. The church stood without a roof, and its gothic stained-glass windows were long gone. In their place shone the sparkling green lattices of a pretend roof and a pretend glass, each swirling to whatever imagined sights the village AI desired. At the moment, the green roof mirrored the swirls of the Milky Way, while the windows showed Krista playing in a green forest. Red Day whispered for Krista to be careful, which disturbed her. You must be careful, Plague Bird. The blood AI was supposed to be able to handle any problem, even other AIs. That's not true. A tinny voice sighed. Your blood AI is equipped to destroy both human and AI, but that hardly means it can handle all problems. That's why it can't be trusted without a human to control it. Krista walked into the church. Before her rose a glowing green altar. She sat before it on an ancient wooden pew its rotten supports creaking. Do you know why I'm here? She asked. Yes. Jennery Flats killed a child of this village, and not any child. The first truly human child we've produced with none of the pox-driven craziness in him. He could have done so much for us. Krista nodded. She'd found the young boy's body floating down the river attracted to the grim discovery by Red Day's heightened senses. The boy had looked perfectly human, with beautiful brown skin and wondrous black eyes. No hint of gene-sliced animals or creations in him. The altar in front of Krista shifted into a green version of the little boy, water dripping from his mouth as he gasped for breath. Krista looked away, both puzzled and sickened. She asked Red Day why the village AI would project such a disgusting image, but the blood AI had retreated so far into her body, she couldn't speak to it. It's scared, the green AI said. Scared you won't do your duty. My duty is... difficult. I've only been a plague bird for a short while. This isn't a life I chose. The village AI flickered as if intrigued and reached out long green tentacles of light which wafted transparently through the air as they caressed Krista's mind. Yes, and no, it said. You were tricked into hosting the blood AI, but you did make the final choice. Krista remembered her so-called choice. As the previous plague bird had died her body exhausted from long centuries of life, Red Day had reached hungrily for her friends and family. If Krista had refused to accept the AI, to bond it to herself, everyone she loved would now be dead. Her village AI had tricked her into accepting Red Day by making her choose between saving her family and friends 
and her own revulsion at becoming a plague bird. That wasn't a true choice, she muttered. Perhaps. But who among us, AI or human, is given uninfluenced options in life? Before Krista could answer, the AI whispered in her mind of the grand days before humans gened themselves nearly to extinction. How the billions who died would have killed for Krista's choice. Ghostly faces and bodies swept around her, all the dead who'd ever been. She felt their pain, felt their anguish as people who'd once been human tore apart their own civilization as animal impulses erased all desire to hold the world together. But Krista also saw the power of those days, the pride of humans leaving their weak bodies behind as they gened themselves into new beings, of how they and their AIs felt so confident they dared build ships to reach beyond the stars. Krista gasped as she returned to her senses and found herself again sitting on the rotten church pew. Above her, the roof's projected Milky Way spun as time itself turned, eon after eon flowing through this AI. With a flash, Krista realized the truth of what this creature was telling her that the amazing universe humans and AIs had almost created would return that one day humanity and AI would complete what they started. Krista smiled. She wished she could live in those future times when the goals of humanity were far more than mere survival. I can help you, the AI said. Have you ever dreamed of going to the stars? I don't know. When I was young, I spent many nights staring at the stars. It's the wolf in me. But even as Krista said this, she realized that instead of merely staring at the stars, maybe she'd also wanted to go to them. That maybe this was what she'd always needed in her life. It is indeed what you've always needed, the AI said. Together, we'll return to the stars. How? Everything we once had is gone. Nonsense. Pieces remain. Like the dam holding back this lake, everything that once pushed humanity to create their wonders still exists, only scattered. It is up to us to reassemble our dreams. Krista grinned, imagining flying into space and seeing her world from above. As the green AI's tentacles caressed her body, she realized she had been wrong about AIs. They could be trusted. They truly had humanity's best interest in mind. A tear slid down her face as she remembered the goodness of her old village AI. How it had been the right thing for that AI to trick her into accepting the amazing responsibilities of being a plague bird. But... Even as Krista realized this, Red Day poked out of its hiding place deep within her body and slapped away the green AI's mental grip. Krista gasped as the rotten pew she sat on shattered, dropping her to the stone floor. She looked at the green AI's flickering altar, where before she'd been ready to throw herself before it and profess her love and loyalty, she now remembered her own village AI's deceit. With a painful shiver, she realized this green AI had attempted something similar. It had tried to trick her into doing its bidding. Although what that bidding might be, she couldn't say. The green AI laughed. <laughs> you deserve each other. See to your duty. I have work to do. Krista stood from the floor and bowed. Once outside the church door, she gave in to her wolf side and ran, running faster than she'd run in months, running until she'd reached the safety of the forest, running until Red Day reminded her that plague birds should never flee in fear from anything, even if there are things for plague birds to fear.
That evening at the alderman's house, Krista cooked eggs and bacon in the stone fireplace, while Jenry Flats glared in silence from the dinner table. Krista had insisted Jenry join her. When Krista placed the food before Jenry, the woman chuckled nervously. <laughs> A last meal? She asked softly. Perhaps. Or perhaps an opportunity for your side of what happened. Since when are there sides to plague birds? Jennery said, draining her cup of milk and quickly shoveling eggs into her mouth. The woman wore one of the alderman's fur robes, which would no doubt annoy the man, as would the woman eating at his table. Krista could easily see the bulge of the woman's belly. She was probably five months pregnant. Based on my senses, exactly twenty-one weeks, Red Day whispered. And why didn't you know this when you first touched her? Krista asked. You know why? She did indeed. For some reason, the village AI had masked the woman's pregnancy from Red Day's senses in the same way the blood AI could mask Krista from the eyes and ears of regular people. Subtlety upon subtlety. But to Krista's knowledge, no village AI should be able to do that same trick against a plague bird, or be allowed by its programming to infiltrate Krista's mind like this one had done. The fact that the village AI had been able to so easily manipulate Red Day's senses indicated a level of power which scared them both. Its name is Dawnbringer. I'm certain it is one of the original AIs, and it is powerful. All of the original AIs were either restricted in their power or destroyed, but for some reason Dawnbringer wasn't. How do you know this? When Dawnbringer manipulated your mind, it did the same to me. It almost had me wanting to join you in flying to the stars. Although obviously that's no longer an option for any human or AI. Why does it want this woman killed? Krista wondered. Try and find out, the blood AI said. While I create some privacy. Krista nodded. Jenry's eyes narrowed as Krista pulled one of her knives and sliced her wrist. <clears throat> Krista's blood shot across the room, swirling and twisting as Red Day expanded until it coated everything in a hazy redness. Krista had never freed this much of the AI before, and felt weak. Neither she nor the AI could remain apart for long without risking damage. I've isolated us, she told Jenry. My blood blocks your village AI from seeing or hearing us. Why did you kill the child? You've witnessed my memories. I was jealous of the alderman's son. Dawnbringer said my child would be born with the gene pox. I lost control at the news. Krista watched the woman calmly relate this fact, and remembered how Jennery had also faced death with dignity. Hardly the actions of a person who lost control and killed the helpless. W were you happy in this village? Compared to what? To joining the Hunt Clans? I want better for my child than to run the forest like an animal. Around them, Red Day's glow faded. Krista didn't have much time. With the remaining drops of the blood AI still inside her, Krista caressed Jenry's skin. The woman's memories flashed through her with incredible speed. Krista saw the day of the killing, saw Jenry weeding her crops, saw her returning home, falling asleep and waking to the news that a child was missing. Overlaying those memories were others, of the child being thrown off the dam into the spillway's surging waters. But there was no way these differing memories of the same day could exist. And the person killing the child wasn't a woman. He was a man. A man with much larger hands than Jennery could offer. Hands not covered in the down feathers which coated Jennery's body. The alderman's tiger-striped hands. He'd killed his own son. You didn't murder anyone, Krista gasped. Don't bring your place those memories in your mind. 
and Jenry Flats growled, Ugh! angry, furious, as Krista collapsed to the floor. She needed the AI back inside her. With a sigh, Red Day poured into Krista's body. The AI was nearly back when suddenly it screamed. A bolt of pain which also smashed through Krista. The room spun as her eyes sparked to green jumping fire. Dawnbringer had just attacked them. As the room returned to its normal candlelit gaze, and as Red Day whimpered within her, Krista saw the alderman standing outside the window, grinning, backlit by Dawnbringer's emerald glow. The alderman tapped the tattoo on his cheek. A good hunt! He yelled as villagers ran to join him. That's all we've ever wanted! A good hunt! Krista bolted for the door, but it crashed open before she could reach it. A short, stout woman, who barely reached Krista's shoulder, squealed from a tusked mouth. The wild boar bristles on her face and body extended in anger. Krista sliced her wrist to release Red Day, but instead of spurting free, only a few drops flew at the woman. But they were enough. Even though Red Day was injured, the AI melted into the woman's face as she screamed and fell backward. More villagers crashed through the door and the window. Krista flung more blood at them, killing three more. Their bodies ripping apart to spasms of meat and pain. But Red Day was too weak to stop them all. Krista slashed what looked like an ape man with her knife as she ordered the blood AI to strengthen her body. She then ran at the log cabin's back wall. The foot-thick logs burst outward as the house fell in on itself. Krista picked herself up from the cold, dewy grass. For a moment, she glimpsed Jennery running away. She'd also fled through the hole Krista made. But when Krista stood to follow, she screamed. <coughs> She'd broken her right leg and arm crashing through the logs. Run for the lake, Red Day said weakly. I'll try to heal your injuries. Krista nodded and stumbled toward the forest as the hunt howled around her. Grabbing a large sapling, Krista snapped it in half and used the trunk as a crutch. Each step blinded her with pain and her injured arm hung limp on ripped tendons. Instead of running silently, like she usually did, Krista crashed through the forest, blundering into trees and branches and feeling like nothing more than wounded prey. As she neared the lake, she saw the dam, the clear nanofilaments glowing icy fire to the moonlight, a half mile to reach the other side. If she could cross the dam, she could hide in the forest behind the church. Come out, plague bird! The alderman yelled, his voice mixing to tiger growls. Give up, and I promise all the quickness we can muster! Krista saw a blur of movement around her. The entire village had turned hunt and were after her. And flickering among the trees was Dawnbringer's green light, directing the hunters toward her. Why doesn't Dawnbringer attack again? She wondered. It's playing, Red Day answered. I'm so weak now, we're all mere toy to it. Krista staggered painfully onto the dam's walkway as the howls grew closer. She walked as quick as she could, but halfway across, she missed a step and fell. Her crutch falling over the side and tumbling into the spillway far below. In a flash, the memory of Jennery Flats doing the same to the child overwhelmed her. Krista pulled herself back from the edge, shivering. No, Jennery hadn't killed the child. Those were someone else's memories. But the swirl of murder, of hands tossing the child into the waters below, still felt as real as anything Krista had ever known. She shook the memory away. She had to keep going. Krista crawled on across the causeway, but now 
The still lake waters turned against her as shadows rippled beneath the surface, arrowing in her direction. Krista slung drops of blood in the water, trying to use Red Day's power to sense what was coming. But it was no use. He was too weak. She might as well be blind. Suddenly, a massive shape exploded from the water, and her chest burned as claws tore shirt and flesh. She stared into a man-like face covered with slick brown seal fur. The body behind it rippled to muscles and blubbery skin, bigger than an ox with webbed hands ending in hooked claws. She leapt aside, narrowly avoiding the creature's grasp and barely stopping herself before toppling off the dam. The beast snarled, exposing a mouthful of crooked, yellowed fangs. The creature dove for her again as Red Day spun from Krista's wounded body and speared the seal man's fiery eyes. The beast howled in pain and clawed at his face before falling off the dam. But where before Red Day had always returned to her body automatically, this time Krista's blood fell from the air like weak rain. Krista touched her fingers to the dam's clear surface, trying to reclaim the AI's essence. Leave it, Red Day said. My core is still within you, but we must hurry. I'm barely keeping you alive. Krista crawled on only to hear the alderman's laugh. (laughs) He stood behind her on the dam, grinning alongside several villagers holding curved knives. Krista again tried to release Red Day, but the AI was now too weak to attack. She started to dive into the lake, but saw several more seal humans waiting, gnashing their large canines at her. The only other option was to jump off the dam into the spillway's froth of angry water. You must jump, Red Day whispered. I can't protect you now, but if I have time to recover, I might be able to bring you back. That didn't sound promising to Krista, but an arrow shooting by her head changed her mind. She rolled off the dam and fell for long seconds before hitting the churning water below. The last thing she knew was spinning, spinning in an endless cycle of up and down until she screamed, sucked water into her lungs, and finally, truly died. So there you go, folks. That was our story. Okay. Well, okay, that wasn't our story. Hold on a minute. That was half of the story. We, we failed to warn you about that before the story on purpose, started. I would, have, I would have screamed at you if you had. Oh, yeah? Because, yeah, I, I wanted to trick people into listening to this. <laughs> hey, Big, what is it we usually do after the story? Uh, I believe after the story comes the cast list. That will never be funny, will it? No matter no. how hard we try. No. I won't say that. That's mean. So, hey, would you give us a little bit of a cast list? Sure, I'll give you a little bit. I'm, you know what? I'm only going to give you the cast list for part one. Because part two is still to come. Spoilers. All right, go <laughs> ahead. So, Big Anklevich was it's the douche. narrator. Mm-hmm. What were you starting to say? I said, thanks, Brian Lincoln, for producing this episode. <laughs> All right. El Scribe Harris played Krista... Rish Outfield was the blood AI. Veronica Belmont played Jennery Flats. Wait a second, the one with the bangs? That's the one. Wow. That's that's above your eyes, your hair hangs. All right. I I will accept that. Okay. (laughs) Paul Coor plays the Alderman. Yes, that Paul Coor. James David Jackson played.
played Dawnbringer. Cool. And Brian Lincoln was the Bear Man and the Seal Man. That's not casting against type, is it? Anyhow, thank you, everybody, for your voices. Hope to hear more of you next week. We, we, Wait, we, next time? How, how long are these episodes going to be separated, do you think? We could probably be just about a week. It's possible. Okay, so early May for, for, <laughs> for the next part of the story. Do you care to explain to the audience how I decided to cut the episode in half? Or no? Uh, uh, sure. Yeah, I'll tell why you decided. Was that arrogant of me? I don't know. I wonder if or it, just in character. I wonder. <laughs> I wonder if it was you. I don't even recall to tell you the truth. But yeah, as we were recording this story, we were recording and we were recording and we were recording and we were recording. And yeah, at some point we we're just like, holy crap. It turns out the story's really long. We didn't realize it. The story really isn't that extremely long, word count-wise. For example, we just did Save the Date a couple weeks ago. That story was almost the same word count as this one. But the length of the finished thing, it seems like it's going to be double because we stopped this story at a good stopping point, a, a point where it's a good moment in the story to quit because... After all, the character's dead, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say there's at least a third of the story to go, and we're 50 minutes in. Usually that's the length of the completed story that we do on the show. So at that point, when we'd been reading and reading and reading, we said, you know what? I think we need to split this one in two. And so we told Brian on the recording, here is the end of this part. And then we moved on. Now, did we just force that on him? Could he have just gone on to the end if he had wanted to? We forced it on him. Okay. We're evil like that. But this is only the second time we've ever split a story. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it is. The only other time we've done it was with Cory Doctorow's story, the... This must be the... This must be the place. Spock! That story was, yeah, at least 3,000 words longer, but it probably runs longer than this one does. But yeah, I'm just surprised at how long the same story can run. Like we said, save the date. A couple weeks ago, same word count, but it's nowhere near as long when it's read. I don't know how that works out. Well, I think there was a heck of a lot of dialogue in save the date. I don't know what determines that, because two stories with the exact same word count could be 20 minutes difference read aloud, just depending on the reader, depending on the tone of the story. And then, yeah, the breakup of dialogue you know, like you and I talking back and forth, we've probably done, you know, 5,000 words between us already. <laughs> I guess that's true. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm crazy that way. But in typing it up, you'd be like, holy cow, <laughs> all this wasted space that is Rich Outfield. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I think we felt like we were giving Brian a break, giving him uh, an extra week to work on it. And, and ultimately, it didn't work out that way, but it gives us twice as many Veronica Belmont fans to visit us. <laughs> it gives us twice the Brian Lincoln for half the price. There you go. That's good, too. I guess half the price of free is still free. But yes, thanks so much for doing that. This production on this uh, story, as is always the case, is awesome. I mean, Brian never fails to impress with the stuff that he puts together. He does some really good stuff every time around. And you know how we're always talking about the problem with Sting is that he gets tired of doing what he's done before and he has to challenge himself mm -hmm. and tread new ground and try new instruments and new styles and all that stuff. I kind of get the impression Brian's like that too. He looks through the stories and he's like, what would be a challenge? What have I not done yet? What would be difficult? Okay, I'll pick that one. Whereas my tendency is just like, okay, what's the shortest? What's the easiest? <laughs> what's the... Okay, maybe not. Then maybe that's your tendency. My tendency is what will give me the most fun character to portray. Yeah, I don't know. Everybody has their own thing. But yeah, Brian is just always grabbing the one that nobody else wants to do because, wow, that's going to be work. Right. And sometimes you'll just say, oh, yeah, I feel like I need to work on editing dialogue so that it really feels snappy and seems like it goes together or something. So he'll pick a story that has lots of dialogue in it or... I think he did that with that uh, Dark Detour. Dark Detour, okay. And uh, I need a story that has lots of action because I want to work on the action, you know, editing or whatever. So, yeah, he's definitely improving every time he does something. 
And he is getting ready for his own novel that he wrote. He's putting that together and going to release that. And, and he's... Milf Continent, I believe it's called. <laughs> Look for that, folks. It's, a, it's a, an erotic fantasy story set on a, uh, an island of unwed mothers. No? Oh, I'm sorry. I was reading the wrong copy. <laughs> that was the thing you wrote up about your story, sir. <laughs> They can look forward to that as well. <laughs> but yeah. yeah Bri- Brian has written a novel that he's going to do entirely in full cast with music and sound effects and like ululations like peace. <laughs> and so, I mean, he has got his work cut out for him. But I think that means once he's started on, what is it called? Malcontent. Right. Captain of the uh, Starship Serenity, I believe. <laughs> Once he starts on that, he probably won't be able to do any episodes for us. So, Yeah, that might be true. The one thing that he's planned to do with his story, which most people don't, they're afraid to do, I guess, or maybe they just feel, feel that they'll probably run out of steam. He plans to do every episode all the way, f- have them all in the can, finished and done before he starts releasing the first one. I think he's trying to make sure that there's never that moment that it seems like you get with everybody who does a podcast novel where they've released like eight episodes and then they're like, uh, we're going to have a hiatus for a little while. Because I've had a nervous breakdown (laughs) or because I read the comments on the second episode. (laughs) And so their story gets started and just as you get into it, they have to take a break from it for a while because they're unable to keep up with the schedule of releasing And uh, Brian, his plan is to not do that whatsoever. He wants to have all 78, no, I don't know how many episodes there are, but I would assume probably more like 20. He wants to have all those episodes in the can finished before he starts releasing the first one. Wow, have you any idea how much work that would be? It turns out that I do have an idea because I've done more than 50 episodes of this show. Okay, but you tend to release them as soon as you're finished. That's true. I guess there's that. What if I told you you had to have 50 episodes in the can because we are going to do 50 in a row for the month of February? (laughs) (laughs) That would be a bad idea. Indeed it would. Speaking of bad ideas, there were two things that I wanted to say, and then we'll let people go because we're going to save all of our comments about the story itself until after the story. Right. When it's completely finished. Right, that's what we usually do. In fact, usually we don't even talk this long on a two-part episode. Yeah, we can't help it, though, anymore. We're just diarrhea-of-the-mouth type people. I'm extraordinarily lonely. I hope people don't pick up on that. Uh, O-A-O-T, you know, sad music, go. So, you know, it's just expressing myself through you. And plus, I have this imaginary audience that I think are listening to me. And it's like, (laughs) I'm not alone. You want me to tell you what the uh, stats were? Oh. (laughs) Just don't ask. Oh, no. Please (laughs) never tell me. (laughs) <laughs> Luckily, we have that last episode ready to go yes. for the day that you tell when me. When I finally do stuff. tell you how many people actually are listening, oh. you'll realize that it's definitely not worth it. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, RRT. Okay, sh- switch to the even sadder music, would you? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. Wait, is there something sadder than the... Uh... The Schindler's List? I thought, since you know music so well, maybe you know something that's even more depressing. No, no. Just the lonely violin or whatever on the Itzhak Perlman yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, we'll get Itzhak Perlman to, to play the Hulk, the Hulk theme on theme. his violin. I almost said <laughs> banjo. So, hey, one other thing about Brian. Uh, before he abandons us in favor of <laughs> the island story. Malcontent. Is he's got a podcast called fullcastpodcast.com. Thank you, Paul. And uh, often he will make episodes where he talks about the Dune Steve episode that he did and how he achieved a certain effect. And I hope that he does it for this one. Mm-hmm. So go over to fullcastpodcast.com yes, <laughs> and check that out. And perhaps you will become inspired to do your own audio novel or to do your own podcast or, or whatever it is. It's, uh, it's, it's fulfilling to me, and it means that I never have to write. So thank you, Dune Steve. Right, yeah, and the cool thing about his podcast is it's like an instructional how-to make yourself a podcast, a full cast show. So you are thinking about having a podcast, go check it out. The 
Parsec Award winning. That's right. Yeah, interesting that. Um, He won a Parsec for his show when he was at the Dragon Con last year. And I believe that's the same time that he happened to meet Veronica Belmont, who plays a character of voice in today's show. Okay, she has very nice bangs and like 1.5 million Twitter followers. Those are the two things I know about her that I can say on the air. There you go. The rest are, yeah, things you can't say on the air, so we won't go there. We, uh, yeah, we'd, we'd like to say hi to all her fans who uh, have come. Oh, they've long since turned it off and <gasps> thrown the machine against the wall. That's true. They were listening yeah, they to it on their car radio and they threw it against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> but if there's any of them left, welcome and goodbye. We'll be no, back. No, they'll, they'll be back next yeah, week. Yeah, we'll be back next week with more Veronica Belmont continuing the uh, story. But yeah, it's cool to have her on here and Paul Coor as well. Now, These we're are... with Paul Coor, not November's Doom Paul Coor, is it? I believe so. Yeah, Brian is really good at rustling up folks like this, people that somebody actually cares about as opposed to, you know, you and I, who are sadly the ones doing the most speaking in these stories. <laughs> Well, no, 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 that next Joe Zija story, I've got uh, Rick Ocasek doing a voice. Oh, sweet. That's going to be hot stuff because Rick Ocasek is hip and now. <laughs> so is there anything else? Uh, well, there, there were there were other voices. Uh, we'll do like a, a full cast list next week. Full cast. Yes. We'll have, <laughs> we'll have Brian send us over a full cast list. And uh, Aroiruti, could you play the theme to the full cast list, please? Thank you. The Schindler's... Okay, not, not funny. Nice try. The only other thing that I have to say is to remind folks that we've got our incentive episode available. So if you're interested in hearing Rish Outfield's You've Got a Friend... And even if you're not. And even if you're not, donate to the show and you get the link to download this story and check it out. It's a good story. It's one of Rish's betters. As you know, there's not a lot of them. Um. <laughs> yes, thank you, ROT. The joke has gotten a little old. Uh, okay, donate to the show. Listen to You've Got a Friend, and you can decide for yourself. There you go, yeah. I think you'll enjoy it. I enjoy it. I think maybe part of it is because the uh, main character was loosely based on myself, and uh, that's f- fun for me that it's loosely based on me and maybe since folks know who i am they might find it fun as well but even if you don't still donate to the show folks seriously we need it my computer's about to die and i may need to buy a new one soon so yeah that's a weird thing is we keep having to stop during our recordings just in case it crashes because it's been crashing on you and crashing all the time that's too bad, because I remember when you got this computer, it cost way more than you'd ever spent on a computer yeah. before, because you were thinking of going into a different line of work, and that didn't work out for you. Or, did it? Right, no, it didn't. I'm... Um, and so you got a really great computer to help you with that, and then and it still amazed me when you got it, because it could do so much. And technology progresses so fast now that I guess there are things where you're like, oh, sorry, my computer won't play that. Or I'm sorry, my computer can't. Yeah, for the most part, it can handle things, but yeah. it's getting old is the problem. It's gotten to the point where uh, its processor, I think, can't handle things as well as it used to. I'm not sure. Maybe it's just burning out. I know that the video card is going and at some point it will go completely. And when that happens, because it is together with the motherboard the whole thing has to be replaced but yeah the crashing thing has started up within the last month or so where it just crashes a lot you might notice that dune steve episodes are being released a little slower because we have to do them again yes aside from in february where they're released every friggin day but yeah they're getting released a little slower because yeah i keep i, I get part way through it i'm doing it and then it crashes on me and i've lost everything i work and i'm not smart enough to learn the lesson to save frequently so hopefully either i'll learn that lesson or i'll get a new computer probably getting a new computer is more likely though well until that day until all are one <laughs> 
I have been Rich Outfield. That's right. Don't say goodbye. Say good journey. I've been Big Anklevich. Thanks for listening, folks. See you next week. Why not? That's right. Why not come back next week? If you enjoyed today's episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, please drop by iTunes and give us a five-star rating. We'd be eternally grateful you did. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Keep on flying. Take two. Testing. One, two, three. These pop filters smell kind of funny, don't you think? You don't notice the smell, do you? There's a smell, but it doesn't bother me. I've said that to you before, and you're just like, what smell, you douche? Shut up and die. What smell, you <laughs> douche? In the six months since this creature had entered her body, she'd been... <laughs> it's one of those kind of stories, is it? Murder, death, kill. <laughs> we haven't had a murder, death, kill since 2038. Well, played bird? Sorry, wait. I'm not really him. I don't know. You might be. Who knows? Well, plague bird? Well, plague bird? Well, plague bird. I'm not really him. I'll no, do the uh, no, John Wayne voices. They were all him. good. I was just laughing at your first one. It was like Don Knotts, wasn't he? <laughs> Andy! I locked the keys in the squad car again, Andy! Well, plague bird? What do you think? Should we rip and tear and gut her? Too harsh, huh? You wanted to kill a pregnant woman. Too harsh, eh? You wanted to kill a pregnant woman. A. A is so Canadian, though. Huh is more natural. <laughs> I'm a southerner. I can make that call. All right, I'll do the A. Too harsh, eh? Okay. Too harsh, eh? Oh, oh. harsh. <laughs> Gorsh. <laughs> All right, now I'm done. <laughs> okay, now the cat's looking at me like I'm a freak. It's all right, Darcy. I am a freak. Yeah, walk away. Too harsh, eh? Why am I talking? Harsh, ha, ha, harsh, too harsh, eh? I'm out of your state. I'm out of your state. Okay, I swear I'm done. <laughs> Can Geico really save you up to 15% on car insurance? Does, an, does a Yub Cote? All right. Uh, yeah. Boo. <laughs> Can't believe she'd do that. I think we're supposed to hiss and growl. Boo! Boo! Yeah. Bow down to her! <laughs> you bitch! Oh, no! <laughs> Motherfucker. Brian <sighs> Lincoln loving son of a... <clears throat> Ooh, that was close to being a vomit all over the mic burp. <clears throat> Thank goodness we've got... Spit guards. What are these called? Pop filters. Uh. Oh, you cat. Excuse me. Soft kitty, dead kitty, little ball of bones. Happy kitty, sleepy kitty. <laughs> so, you have a twin sister. Obi-Wan was wise to hide her from me. Now, say it with me, come on. Now his failure is, is complete. complete. Kristen nodded calmly, but Red Day shrieked inside her. Red day shrieked oh, inside no, her. Finish that. Red day okay. shrieked inside her. Krista nodded calmly, but red. But red day shrieked inside her. <laughs> Sorry.
Ow, jeez. Oh, okay, Jesus Christ definitely doesn't work in a futuristic sci-fi. Yeah, no. Good job, Scribe. Good job. Ooh. He's got an accent. Oh, sorry. I'm sure Brian will make him right. Ayub Kote. Oh, hey, maybe Ayub Kote could be the other... A Never mind. What? Cross the dam. The AI is in the church on the other side, don't you know? Sorry. I swear, I feel like my mouth is just full of spit and I'm like slobbering on myself almost today. I don't know what the deal is. Uh. She burped at it to push the fear away. And then Krista climbed up to the... <laughs> Buckyball you, mother Buckyball her. You are. That is an awesome word. Buckyball needs to be used so much more often than it is. I don't know that I've ever heard it before, but I want to hear it again. It's probably not been invented yet. <laughs> <laughs> the front of the dam dropped down for several hundred yards into a straight-edged spillway, which surged with... <laughs> with farts. No! Oh! I've only... Hi, Train. Oh my god, everything is conspiring against me. Krista, I feel your pain. <laughs> that wasn't a true choice. That wasn't that, probably. We, we need two syllables in that. That wasn't a true... Seriously? Really? More planes? Really? Better be a goddamn invasion. I don't even live near an airport. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> What's wrong? Nothing. My eyes are burning. My eyes! The goggles, they, they do, do nothing. nothing. Ah! <laughs> this is not a good growl. Um, I'm not supposed to, I'm supposed to say the line before that. No. Ah! Ah! That word needs to be used almost as much as Bucky Balls need to. <laughs> Bucky Balls! <laughs> almost 200 years the Statue of Liberty has come to signify peace for naked women everywhere. Bucky Balls! <laughs> it's interesting that you know that quote as well as I do. I think it was hope, but I said peace. I don't know why. Bucky balls, where was I? Krista say, flung more blood. But Red Day was too weak to stop the war. Pain. Okay. See, I, I intended to do no breaths at all when I did his voice. But how do you do, like, tired and out of breath without... Being I'm, tired and out of breath. Without breathing. The breast held in pain. Uh, <laughs> I noticed it was breast, too. Uh. But I tend to you know, notice breasts yeah, first when, thing. Yeah, whenever I see a breast, it just pops out at me. If you know what I'm saying. I wish I could say the same. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to say the breast held in pain again. because How close to done are we? Not very. Maybe we should split this into two episodes. It's significant enough. We could do with double the pleasure. That's Double true. Your fun. Yeah. The end of part one. Yeah, maybe we should make this a two-part episode. It is longer than frick. I wish we could. Right here it says we're on page forty-eight of eighty-three. 83. Yeah, that's just barely over half. With a previously on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it would be the exact same length. Part two, you know. <laughs> um. I wish there were a way we could have our cake and eat it to release it in two chunks. But once the second chunk is out, have it always only be one episode. Yeah, and then there's no real way to do that. You know, it's just like really two episodes airing two weeks apart. But then when they come out on video being on the same tape, you know. Well, when this comes out in video... We'll put it on the same tape. Wouldn't okay? this make a great like graphic novel and stuff? I'd love to see like the 
the the freakish the seal walrus man guy and... seal guy and the 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 hog chick the scott pig <laughs> you know what i was talking about there was like a yeah, the, a poor well, sign she was a uh a, a wild boar, boar yeah, woman boar. yeah she was a total boar but here's the thing is if we did it in two episodes we could have chick on one and like seal guy or boar woman on the other anyhow yeah with that scar that Seal has on his face, that the would make, star, yeah, that would make awesome. That would make awesome. <laughs> that would make awesome episode art. Oh, okay. The star. <laughs> oh, you didn't get what I was referring to. I was talking about Seal. The oh, there used to be a certain. Did you see that one? That sucks that we both did a different part of the same song, but it was the same song. Should know. Have you seen that episode yes. of Community? <laughs> you, you Tweeting me, it. Didn't you tell me that was had the best title? I, I don't think so. It was what something was like Gay One Hundred and One or no, something. No, that like. was that was uh, Introduction to Gay. Yeah, Introduction to Gay was the one before it <laughs> though, was... where it was a pocket full of Hawthorns. Oh, okay. Uh, I did really enjoy the stuff with the dean. Uh-huh. He's such an amusing character. And there wasn't even a moment with Chang in that episode. So it was, I, I should, I should give it better, a better rating than I have. I liked the, uh, you know, there's some good stuff in that episode. It's like hashtag Annie's move. And they've got the shirts with the, Yeah. <laughs> and they kept saying stuff and then going, tweeting it. Oh, that makes me so, feel so old, that <laughs> tweeting thing and the hashtag. I didn't know that's what that was called. Oh, a hashtag? Mm-hmm. Well, if you had a Twitter account. I never shall, dude. Seriously. Know. If somebody's told me you get a dollar for every person that follows your tweets, I would still never do it. I just, I hate that. <laughs> Did you see that I made a twabble? I did. And it was clever, but I wish you wouldn't call it that. <laughs> Although, in your defense, you did say it was the last you'll ever do. Yeah, probably. I don't know that I'll ever Did you that. see my newest uh, travel that I put on? I did, but I think? would hate. I do hate that you call it that. No, I actually haven't seen it. <laughs> is, it is it just me, or, or are you a monstrous douche? I am, pretty much. Am I just realizing this after all these years? <laughs> <laughs> we now bring you part two of Plague Birds Part Two. Previously on Plague Birds Part Two, Krista woke in the muck. <laughs> Sorry, I was just thinking of your Let's comment where you called song. me a monstrous douche. <laughs> Let's do the seal song. You, I don't know. You know, when the snow hits my eyes, or <laughs> dude, the words to that song can't even be known by human beings. But just, the, the song, words have never meant they're anything. They're so ridiculous. Yeah. I liked that song, though. I remember. Oh that. yeah, I actually owned that. That's probably CD. my favorite song in '95. Oh, you had the whole album. I actually bought the CD. I got it from uh, BMG or whatever. Mm. I listened basically to that one song, and there was nothing else worth having on it. You tipped over your microphone. Uh, Can we uh, make the echo go away? It's gotten so far behind that now it just... It's bothering you? Does it not bother you? It's embarrassing! (laughs) Uh, There we go. Now you're getting greedy. (laughs) <laughs> that's weird because not very often do i burp and am i able to smell <laughs> what does announcer man say that's some kind of osha violation <laughs> it turns out this story is really long we didn't realize did it. you do a word count on but uh, next we, uh, next week let's we do opened it up particularly to do that and then never did <laughs> tune in next week when we'll tell you how long the story was. Dee, doo, doo. I say 12,000 words, Jack. Mm, you're way off. Only 9,189. Oh, you went over. That's right. Last time the story was 3,000 words at least longer. I think it was a 12,000 word or... No, you know what? This is the second time. That's what I said. Third time. Did we split... No, we didn't, did we? We just did it as one big long story. That cowboy 
Cowboys and one. Indian. Yeah, the Cowboys and... Gargoyles one. Yeah. That one wasn't split, was it? I don't remember. I don't think we did. I think we just did it as a hugely long episode. I think you're right. Yeah. But I remember there being an temptation to split it at the time. Yeah, I think we considered it. But, but we all, the up. reason we didn't split it is we couldn't find a place that felt natural. It would either have had to have been split early, early on, because there's a break, or almost at the very end. It was yeah. like, well, okay, there's no place. that. Speaking of bad ideas. Bad idea genes. Oh, yes. Even though it's over, I'm going to tell my wife about the affair. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.